वेलकम बैक आपको बताएं कातिल मौसम में के टू सर करने का मिशन पाकिस्तानी कोहपेमा मोहम्मद अली सतपारा अली सतपारा और गैर मुल्की कोहपेमाओं की तलाशी मुहिम जो मोहम्मद अली सतपारा और मोहम्मद अली सतपारा और पाकिस्तान आइसलैंड जोनोरी एंड चिलीज हुआ पेबलो मोर है My friends now often ask me, Ali, when are you going to die? By 2019, Muhammad Ali Sadpara had lost 12 of his 14 colleagues in the mountaineering business, but this would certainly not stop him from going on to conquer multiple 8,000er peaks. Originally from Pakistan, Ali Sadpara was quite literally born into a mountaineering family. The art would be passed down from generation to generation. And in 2021, Ali, along with his own son, Sajid Ali Sadpara, would be attempting to achieve a winter summit of K2. This is their story. Muhammad Ali Sarpara was born on February 2nd, 1976, and is the son of famous Pakistani mountaineer Hassan Sarpara. Ali's father Hassan would become the first Pakistani to have climbed 6-8000ers, including Everest and K2. Five of those peaks would be without supplemental oxygen, with Everest being the only 8000er where oxygen was used. Hassan would go on to have 11 children, but only 4 would survive, with the youngest being Ali. Even though Hassan was a famous mountaineer, their family was poor. Ali would grow up in a village in one of the river valleys of the Himalayan Baltistan region in Pakistan's extreme north. They would mainly live off the land by raising livestock and farming, with some income coming in from a low-level government employee job their father had. It was not the lavish lifestyle you see on television, but for them, it was enough. From an early age it was evident that Ali took after his father and was an athlete. His body composition matched most mountaineers, and this would be further proven when Ali as a boy spent many days climbing up and down rocks around his village. He would gain notoriety in his small community with many claiming that he moved faster than the goats. Ali's father Hassan never had the luxury of an education, so it was important to Ali that he took his studies seriously. Although this couldn't be said about one of Ali's older brothers who struggled with his academics early on. This would lead Hassan to pack up his family and move to Skardu where the children could receive a better education. Ali would go on to finish his studies, and at the age of 19, he felt ready to marry. Due to their culture and customs, he was not allowed to approach his soon-to-be wife Fatima. So his uncle would ask on his behalf. It took some convincing, but Fatima's parents would accept. Marriage brought Ali happiness, but it also brought newly found pressure. His wife would soon be pregnant with their son Sajid, so it fell on Ali to provide for his family quickly. Using his skill set, he would turn to the mountains as a source of income. Being only a teenager, he would begin serving as a porter for foreign mountaineering expeditions, where if he was lucky, could earn up to three U.S. dollars a day. It was hard and grueling work. The porters would be asked to carry a minimum of 25 kilos to various camps like K2 and Broad Peak. Since Ali did not have much wealth, he was unable to afford luxuries like climbing boots. Instead, he would cross the rugged Baltoro Glacier in flip-flops and cast-off gear. On just Ali's second day of being a porter, he dropped his sunglasses during his route. Luckily, his father was following behind him, noticed and picked them up off the ground. Later in the day, when Ali came upon a blazing expanse of snow, he would look for his sunglasses in a panic. Hassan watched his son struggle for a few minutes before pulling out the glasses from his pocket and handing them over, but not before telling Ali, "Small mistakes become big in the mountains. This one might have cost you your sight." As time went on, Ali's skills only grew. He developed into a very strong technical climber and desired more for himself and his family. That time would come when a Pakistani army truck pulled into the town of Satpara in hopes of recruiting climbers to ferry supplies to soldiers in remote mountain passes. During the 1980s, Pakistan was in conflict with India over the Siachen Glacier, and this would play a pivotal role in Ali's life. There is not much to be said about Ali's time with the army. He would spend most of the time scaling snow and ice, but there is one day that he would never forget as he and a fellow pakistani climber settled into their camp for the night ali remembers a soldier next to him 
smoking a cigarette. Within minutes, their location was receiving heavy mortar fire, completely flattening a tent with two men inside. Ollie recalls the sound of their bodies thrashing as they took their last breath. After this experience, Ollie moved on from his time with the army, and this would lead him to commercial mountaineering. Between the years 2006 to 2018, Ollie would go on to become one of, if not the best, Pakistani mountaineer in history. His first 8,000er summit would be Gasher Brum 2, which was done in second-hand climbing gear, I might add, followed by the Killer Mountain, or better known as Nanga Parbat, and many more. For some reason, Ollie would fall in love with specifically Nanga Parbat and achieve some of his most impressive accomplishments on that peak. In 2016, he would be part of a team that achieved the first ever winter summit under temperatures of negative 47 degrees Celsius, and in 2017, he would achieve the first ever autumn summit. The mountain became such an integral part of his life that many attribute the peak's advancement in mountaineering directly to his efforts. Overall, Ali would summit all of the 8,000 er peaks in Pakistan and three more outside of the country, bringing his total to eight. Despite his success, Ali really struggled to find a consistent sponsor for his climbs. So when Icelandic high altitude mountaineer John Snorri approached him in wanting to attempt a winter summit on K2, it was easy to say yes. By this time, Ollie was approaching 45, and his son, Sajid, was a young adult that had begun developing his own mountaineering skills, already having some experience on K2. The father-son duo would team up and join John on their expedition to the Savage Mountain. They did not have very much time to prepare, as the winter months were already upon them, but by November of 2020, they were organized and ready for their journey. At that time, a winter summit on K2 was one of the last great challenges in the mountaineering community. Although the challenge does not actually begin on the mountain, but rather trying to get to base camp, the location of the peak is in an isolated region that straddles the border of Pakistan and China. For Ali, Sajid, and John, this would mean their two-week hike would be over 60 miles, traversing rugged roads and snow-covered valleys. By December of 2020, there were multiple expeditions already setting up lines and supplies on K2 in preparation for a summit push. But the weather made it hard to keep campsites stable, especially the higher up you go. The Savage Mountain is notorious for being an extremely difficult climb, and although the mountain is often compared to Everest, a climber actually has a further distance to travel on K2. This is because the base camp of Everest rests at a higher altitude than K2s. By January of 2021, the average temperature on the mountain was about negative 51 degrees Celsius, with wind strengths up to 120 kilometers per hour. On some days, the higher altitude camps would either be completely wiped off the mountain or deeply buried in snow, causing the expeditions to re-establish camps two and three every so often. For the most part, the weather in January was miserable, but there would be one team that saw an opportunity and took it. On January 16th, a team of 10 Nepali climbers, most notably Netflix's 14 Peaks climber Nims Persia, would achieve a winter summit of K2. Under normal circumstances, most would stop right there, since the goal of being the first is no longer possible. But this actually fueled Ali even more to reach the peak. Furthermore, the Nepali team would end up using supplemental oxygen on their summit bid, so in order to have his own record, Ollie would now make the attempt without the help of O2 cylinders. When asked why he cared so much, Ollie would state, The Nepalese had done it weeks earlier, and I wanted to do it too, because K2 is our mountain. And that chance would certainly come. Towards the end of January and early February, there was a small window of good weather, and most expeditions would begin their summit push at this time. Over the next few days, more than 30 climbers would work their way up the mountain. Most would turn back before hitting the death zone, or 8,000 meters, except for Ali, Sajid, John, and a Chilean mountaineer, Juan Pablo Moore, who had joined the three before their ascent. The group started their summit bid in the early hours of February 4th, right around 7,400 meters. They were about 14 hours from the top, and were expecting to make their final push the next morning. Their progress was steady, and the climb went as expected. The weather was not great, but it was good enough to climb. Night turned to day, and on February 5th at 10 a.m., all four climbers were right under the bottleneck, only 400 meters below the summit. 
The men had been in the death zone for multiple hours, and this was certainly starting to take its toll on Sajid, as he was not feeling well. He would communicate his condition to his father, who would tell his son to use their emergency oxygen cylinder they had brought along. As Sajid began rummaging in his gear looking for the proper equipment, Ali, John, and Moore started to scale the bottleneck, and pretty soon they were gaining distance on Sajid, who after a minute or two finally got his mask regulator and oxygen connected. But once the connection was made, the mask regulator sprung a leak. Ali would hear of this and shout down to his son, don't worry, keep climbing, you'll feel better. But Sajid just did not have the strength to continue, and so he decided to turn back. He remembered seeing his father and the two other climbers around noon, confirming they had made it past the bottleneck, leaving them with no major obstacles from the summit. The three men had a GPS beacon with them, but this would freeze and inevitably stop working. Sajid would end up making it back safely to Camp 4, but sadly, his father would never be heard from again. The very next day, February 6th, a search party would quickly be organized and backed by the Pakistani government as two helicopters flew up to 7,000 meters looking for any sign. Unfortunately, as the hours ticked by, the weather began to deteriorate, which prevented them from searching longer into the evening. On February 18th, 13 days after the summit push, all three climbers were officially declared dead. This announcement was delayed as they were holding out hope, but given the hostile environment of negative 80 degrees Celsius, it is unreasonable to expect anyone to survive under those conditions. There is strong reason to believe that the three climbers, Ollie, John, and Moore, did in fact reach the summit. Most deaths on K2 actually happened during the descent of the climb. It would not be until five months later, on July 26, that all three men's bodies were found. A team of Sherpas scaling the mountain had spotted more first near Camp 4. As they climbed, they found Ali near the bottleneck and John a hundred meters above him. It appeared as though they were working their way down, further indicating that they did in fact reach the summit, but honestly, nobody will ever know for certain. Sajid would help with the recovery of his father and has gone on to develop a strong mountaineering career himself. In 2023 alone, he has conquered Annapurna, Everest, and Nanga Parbat, all without supplemental oxygen. What I think is most impressive is that in July of 2021, the same month he would assist with his father's recovery, Sajid would go on to summit K2 and finish what he started.